Good afternoon and welcome to Caroline Cymru Revision Sessions. This session will focus on History A-Level and will be presented by Andrew Morell from Llanid Lois. The session will last around 45 minutes where the teacher will go through the relevant subject content. If you have any questions, please use the question and answer section and we will endeavour to answer your question during the session. The session will be recorded with the recording and any relevant resources uploaded to the ESCOL website in the Caroline Cymru area. When you're ready, Andrew. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to these uh, History A-Level sessions over the next four weeks. Uh, hopefully I'll be guiding you through, uh, through a little bit of the assessment really for History A-Level. As you can see there, I'm a teacher at uh, San Edloys High School, right in the most beautiful part of the world. And uh, hopefully in the background behind me, you can see the, the Market Hall in San Edloys, that wonderful bit of history, oldest uh, timber frame building in Wales actually, um, and real centre to San Edloys. So, what we hope to do then over the next four weeks is the following. So today we'll be looking at how to manage thematic content and focusing, focusing on the concepts, really a way to help you manage the content, which otherwise seems quite overburdening. Next week then we'll look specifically at essay writing skills and developing reasoned arguments. The following week then on the 21st of March, we'll look at an overview of unit four with a focus on the question one skills. And then on the last session on the 28th, what we'll do is we'll assess a good essay, right? Which, you know, good essay spans across both question one and two and question two in both unit three and unit four. So hopefully over the next, two, uh, next four weeks, we'll kind of guide you through that and you'll just get a bit of a better idea as to how to go about answering the questions in any exam. So today the idea is we'll go through how to manage thematic content and uh, focusing on those key concepts. The rough structure will be as follows. There'll be a kind of 40 minute discussion from me about how to manage them and then about five minutes of question and answers at the end. Um, it might be a slightly longer talk, might be a slightly shorter talk depending on how quickly, uh, how quickly I move. But if you've got any questions as we go along, please don't hesitate to put them in. And as we get to uh, the end, hopefully I'll have a chance to, uh, to answer some, uh, some of them. Um, try and make them about how to manage the content and then in following sessions we'll, we'll answer one specifically about how to answer questions and, and things like that. So the first thing to say is that History A level is made up of 10 different options at Unit 3. So therefore I'm not going to be focusing on specific content today. I'm not going to be focusing on specific content because if I was to do it say for the American Century, the unit that I teach here in Llanid Lewis High School, then the other 90% of you would have absolutely nothing to listen to. So what I've done is I've tried to make it span across all the different options and I'll use examples from across the different options. Obviously my knowledge and my specialism is in the American Century and so that's where I'll use most of my exemplifications, but the skills and the ideas are relevant across all of these different option subjects, right? So it doesn't matter if you're doing reform and discovery in Europe, 1492 to 1610, this should still be relevant to you and be helpful to you as well. Now, unit three is a, is a long one. It's a big one, right? It covers a period of at least 100 years. And within those 100 years, it focuses on two themes. Therefore, it is quite common for Year 13 to say about Unit 3 and frankly, Unit 12 about Unit 1, that they're very content heavy. I get a lot of, there's a lot to know, sir, with that really scared face. And they're absolutely right. Yeah, 100 years, two themes, it seems like a lot. But the crucial element here is that this is a breadth study. It's not a depth study. So you don't need to know the content in as much detail as you do for Unit 2 and Unit 4. They are much more about depth and understanding and drilling down into little bits of detail. Unit three is much more about breadth, the span across time, how things change across time. So it's recommended instead then that you take a much more general overview of important individuals, events, terms, dates that are essential to understanding each theme or smaller issue and not necessarily knowing every single detail about every single little issue. And it's vital then that for period study of unit three, it should be looked at as a whole. And so you should be making links and connections between and across the features and characteristics across this whole time period. You can't treat the first 10 years of the time period in isolation and completely separate from the last 10 years, for example. You've got to be able to see what the connections and what the links are between them. And later on, I'll, I'll give you some planning tools or some tasks, that suggested tasks, that will hopefully help you with making some comparisons across different bits of content. Now, as I said, we're not going to be focusing specifically on content itself, 
One of the reasons for that was, as I said, it's not particularly relevant. Then if I focus on my topic, American Century, the rest of you be sat there looking at me thinking there's absolutely no reason me being here. But another reason is that on the website, on the WJC website, there is some really good resources on these different themes or these different options. So for most of the options, options one, two, uh, one to well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, and ten. There's some good resources on um, the WJC website resources, and this link should be clickable on in the resources that are posted on the, the Catalan Cymru site after this. And then for option eight, the American Century, there is also a revision guide produced by Harder Education. You might well know about that already if you're doing this option, but if you don't, then there's something produced pretty much by the exam board tailored to this specification to help you out as well. And in that is all pretty much all the content you need to know, really. Even if you've not done it all in class, it's there. So let's get down to it, right? How do you manage the content of Unit 3, which frankly appears to be huge when you first look at it? Well, essentially, what I'm going to tell you to do is to focus on the key concepts. By focusing on the key concepts, you allow yourself to get a grasp of it without having to know every single detail about it. And those key concepts are the following. Cause and consequence, significant individuals, turning points, similarity and difference, and change and continuity. And what I'll do in the first bit of this session is just take you through a definition of these. What do we mean by these different things before then giving you some suggested tasks that help you put this into action and really help you hopefully manage some of that content that, as I said, seems so huge and so burdensome at first. Now, this is, uh, this is really coming from the exam board, right, in terms of these thematic or key concepts, right? As you can see here for the American century and also here for another example, poverty, protest and rebellion, theme one, poverty, vagrancy and the poor in Wales. What the exam board do is they actually provide you via this link at the bottom here, which again should be clickable in the resources, provide you with a breakdown of all these different things within those key concepts. So as you can see here, for example, in cause and consequence, you've got the poor law of 1495, role of a church in providing relief, Poor laws, enclosures, poor laws, 1601. In terms of turning points, you've got the paupers, the dissolution of the monasteries, the statues of artificers. I think I said that right. And uh, uh, of 1563. So it's giving you what kind of is posting you in which direction in which you should view these as. But we'll go through these together and I hope help you understand what each of these mean before then, as I said, some suggested tasks to help you. So cause and consequence, well, what do we mean by cause and consequence? Well, a cause is something that made an event happen in the first place, whilst the consequence is the result of it, something that comes after the event. Now, an example here, right, is Russia and its invasion, unfortunate invasion of, uh, or attempted invasion of the Ukraine. Now, if we were to think about it as a cause and a consequence, we're thinking about the cause. It could be that Putin saw Ukraine's request to join the EU as a threat. Right? That could be one of the causes, one of the reasons why Russia has attempted that invasion. And a consequence, absolutely undoubtedly, the unnecessary suffering by ordinary people. So if you look at it in that context, you're not thinking about needing to know every single detail about the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. It's looking at the causes, what made it happen in the first place, and the consequences, what some of the results of it might be. Not what happened on what date, what, uh, what so-and-so said about it. It's not as encompassing as that. It can narrow it down for you a little bit. I hope you narrow that focus down. Well, of course, it's not quite that simple, maybe in history level study, right? As there's always far greater complexities, but nonetheless, the idea applies, right? There could be short or long-term causes and consequences. Things that happen in the short term after event or things that happen in the long term, 50 years after the event. There are obviously more and uh, more significant and less significant causes of events, something that's more likely we are to say that it caused it and stuff that we kind of, yeah, maybe it might have happened, might not have happened without it, but it's not the thing that really caused it. And also things that happen as a result, we can break down into positive and negative. And these are all things you can do with these events, right? You can think about the positives and negatives of the consequences of the historical event. Now, an example of this, right? could be the effects of the Black Death on Wales, right? This comes from unit three, option one, right? And um, in that we can think about, right, the causes. How was the Black Death spread? Was it through the port towns of Carmarthen and Pembroke? Or was it, as they thought maybe more so at the time, the manifestation of evil, right? People in these towns, in these places had done bad things and so God had punishment, punished them for it. 
And so that's looking at the causes, consequences, right? What were the effects? Were the economic hardships of less people to till, to farm the land more significant than fewer monks about to sustain the importance of the church within Wales? Possibly, possibly not. The significant, insignificant. But you can see, again, it's not about knowing everything about the Black Death, not knowing about every detail about the Black Death, how many people died in each town and what the symptoms were and all of that. It's about the effects or the, the causes and the effects, the consequences. And if we have a look at this essay question here, right, come exact, you know, directly from the exam board. I haven't made it up or anything for option two. The question says the most significant cause of poverty and vagrancy in the period 1509 to 1553 was enclosure discuss. So it's not looking at you to describe and talk about everything in the period 1509 to 1553. It's asking you to look at the causes. And so this helps you to deal with all that content, doesn't it? Second element being significant individuals, right? Significant individuals. How important is that individual in comparison to others working on similar things? Now, in your heads now, when you're thinking about the unit you're studying, you're probably thinking about some of the people that you've come across. Now, an example here, right, is Boris Johnson's handling of COVID-19. Is he a significant individual? Is he more significant to the pandemic and the results of the pandemic than the scientists? Is he more significant than the other leaders of UK nations? Mark Drakeford, Nicola Sturgeon, Paul Givan of Northern Ireland. And by making that comparison, you're not you're narrowing it down, aren't you? You're not thinking about everything Boris Johnson has done to handle COVID-19. You're thinking about was he more or less significant than someone else, than the scientists and the other UK leaders? So in terms of history, again, of course, it, maybe it's not quite that simple in your history A level, as there's always greater complexity, but we can compare an individual's role in similar, not, it's never going to be exactly the same, is it, but similar circumstances, maybe certain wartime leaders, maybe leaders facing the same religious change or the same social upheaval. And how significant was their impact in reality, right? Not what was every single action that they took, right? It's not a case of learning and knowing every single action they took, but what was their impact? And so an example from uh, option 10, Russia, right? One of the people named in the specification is Pyotr Stolypin. So we could think, did Stolypin's policies of reform and repression have that big an impact in reality? Were Stolypin's actions better placed, secure government authority, than, say, for example, Laventi Biera in the 1950s? By doing that, you're not thinking about, I need to know everything about Piotr Stolypin. You're thinking about, was he more or less significant than others? Did he have more, more or less of an impact? And to exemplify this again, in terms of, you know, ultimately what the exam board looking for. Well, here we go. Here's an essay question from the exam board from a past paper a few years ago. How far was John Calvin the most significant influence on the spread of Protestantism between 1521 and 1559? So it's not an essay question that says, uh, what were the what actions that did John Calvin take that meant uh, Protestantism spread in the period 1521 to 1559? You'd have to list all the kinds of things that he'd done. It's about how significant was his influence. It's not needing to know everything about him to know about the significance and that alone. This one is our turning point, right? How fundamental was the change brought by brought by this event? Is it fair to say that that change was permanent because of its long-term impact? And an event we might, uh, well, we would have heard of uh, in the news in the couple of, uh, last couple of weeks is uh, Roman, Roman Abramovich selling Chelsea Football Club, right? Particularly due to his connections in Russia. So that's an event, isn't it? Is it a turning point or not? Well, we can answer that by will it change the ability of Chelsea Football, uh, Football Club to buy and sell players and fundamentally change how he, the club, is viewed in Britain? If it is, then that's a fundamental change and that's a turning point, isn't it? So in terms of history, again, it's not quite as simple as that in, uh, in history. There are always far greater complexities, but nonetheless, the point still stands. And therefore, turning points need to reference whether or not the change has a sizable impact in the long term. Does it really fundamentally change how things are? Because if it doesn't, it's not a turning point. If, you know, a week later it hasn't changed anything, it's not a turning point. And so example, right, from the American century, option eight, which I'm, I'm looking at, right, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. What we've got to think about this is, was this near nuclear disaster really enough to be the event that ended the concept of mutually assured destruction? If it is, then we can say it's a turning point. If it isn't, then maybe we say it's just an event rather than a turning point. 
and how long-term and sizable were the changes in how the USA and USSR dealt with each other by the establishment of the hotline between the two, the telephone line between the two, which they hadn't had before. It's undoubtable, really, that it did fundamentally change how the USA and USSR dealt with each other, gave them a direct point of contact. But again, it's not about knowing every single thing about the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? At what time did the ships enter? Uh, what time did the blockade occur to prevent the ships enter the Cuban uh, Sea? What um, time did the, the second officer on the, Q on the Russian submarine refuse to press the button and issue the order for the failure to, to launch the nuclear weapons? It's not about understanding every bit of detail of that. It is about understanding those key concepts. And so here we go, here's an example again from the exam board, from option three. How far do you agree that the publication of Martin Luther's 95 Theses was the major turning point in religion in the period 1500 to 1600? So in that question, it's not asking you to list all of Martin Luther's 95 Theses. It's asking you, was it a turning point? Was it a bigger turning point than any other element in religion at the time? So we've got three so far, haven't we, right? We've got our cause and consequence, we've got significant individuals, and we've got turning points. Next is similarity and difference. Similarity, how similar or how alike the event is to another. Difference, how different or how contrasting the event is to another. Now, my example here is the, uh, the much anticipated release of the final series of Killing Eve. Um, Think about similarity. Well, we could compare the anticipation of that series to the other series, what things were like, the fact that the pundits are talking about it, the fact that people are talking about it, the fact that it all goes on iPlayer at the same time so you can watch all episodes at the same time. That's a similar across a number of series. But a difference, right? Contrast that anticipation to the build up to other series. What differs? Well, as I heard uh, an interview with one of the, of the key actors in uh, Killing Eve the other day, um, they displayed a bit of worry that actually there might be a kind of uh, a thought that this is linked a bit too, maybe it's a bit too close to home in terms of Russia-Ukrainian conflict. Well, that's a massive difference. That wasn't something we had to think about with the release of Killing Eve series two, was it? So there's a similarity and difference. Now again, history, maybe not quite that simple, but nonetheless, similarity and difference compares and contrasts the impact or the success or the attitude to something across both time and regions. So that's time in terms of the 100 year period that you're studying, but it could also be regions, right? I do American century. There is, when it comes to civil rights in particular, there is a big difference in attitudes between the South of America and the North of America, particularly in the early period. So that similarity and difference can be between the South and the North of America, or it can be from 1890 to 1990. An example here from option three is support for the Catholic Church in Spain, Portugal and the Italian states. So how did the church, or how did support for the church differ across the countries of Spain, Portugal and Italy? Right, you can look at the similarities between them, between how it was in Spain, how it was in Portugal, how it was in Italy, but also the differences. How did the support within those countries change over time? Right, the support isn't going to be the same, it's not static, is it? Is there something similar in the support for the church across these countries, something that unites them? Are there differences in support for the church within one of these countries? So again, right, it's not known about everything to do with the Catholic Church in Spain, in Portugal and Italian states. It's about understanding the similarities and differences between them. Another question that exemplifies this from option seven, the reforms of liberal governments, 1906 and 1914, were the most effective attempt at attacking poverty in the period 1890 to 1990. What it's doing is it's suggesting attempts to change and tackle the problem of poverty between 1906 and 1914 may be very, very different from attempts to tackle poverty in, say, 1980. There may also be some similarities, right? Some similar uh, uh, things that are going to prevent them from achieving it as well. And lastly, change and continuity, right? Well, what do I mean by change? Well, change is how a trend develops or changes over time. Whilst continuity, how something stays the same over time. An event that could exemplify this, right, experiences of university life. Now, the changes that technology is being increasingly used and fundamentally changing the way in which education is delivered. And it used to be to anyone in a university, right, over the last three years, they'll have gone from sitting in lecture theatres all the time to now doing stuff behind their computers online. That's a fundamental change, isn't it? But there's always continuity. There's always something that runs through it the same. There's always that shared experience of being somewhere new and the sense of moving forward with life. No matter if you went to university in 1910, if you went to university in 1990, or you went to university in 2018, you're always sharing that experience of somewhere new and moving forward of your life. 
and right may not always be that simple in history there are greater complexities but nonetheless it refer to things that cut across different forms of government and across time like attitudes attitudes can change and they can stay the same policies can change and stay the same ideas experiences they can stay the same or they can change attitudes again you know going back to uh, to civil rights attitudes towards many of the communities in America changes over time. But there may be a continuation of an attitude by all those communities towards the government. They still view the government with suspicion. Another example here, right, from option five, the changing foreign policy of France, 1715 to 1815. So to what extent then did the Ancien Regime, revolutionary governments and Napoleon continue the motive in French policy to secure natural frontiers to ensure the security of the state? All three of them did to some extent. And that is a continuity, something that stays the same. They did it in very different ways, right? What they actually did on the ground is very different than they are your changes. But nonetheless, right, it's not about knowing every single element of foreign policy in France between 1715 and 1815. It's looking for those similarities and those key differences. So again, right, another essay question that exemplifies it. So you don't think I'm just making this stuff all up, right? It is going to help you in exams because this is from the exam board. To what extent was social change the most significant development in Wales in the period 1240 to 1284? Social change. So it's going to ask you there to look at social change, economic change, political change, also social continuities, economic continuities as well. So that's my point. It's not about finding, it's not about knowing everything about every detail of every bit on your specification. It is about narrowing it down and focusing on those key concepts. So, these are then some suggested tasks to help you manage that content. Now we understand what those concepts are, hopefully. This is a way to manage some of the content. So the first suggested task, right, is quite simply to find the specification for your option on the WJEC website. Your teacher may already, or your lecturer may already have given you the specification. In that case, you don't need to do this. But if they haven't, then this is really important. So if you open the document, which right, is called specification like this, and you scroll down, right, between pages 33 and 52, you'll find the content specifications for your option in unit three, whether that's option one, six, or 10. And it will look like this, right? It will give you your two themes, right? So in this case, for Russia, it's got changing leadership and regimes and social and economic impact on the lives of Russian people. And as a result, you can then start to work through the content and work out which bit is about significant individuals, which bit is about changing continuity, etc. Now, to go through this, I'll, I'll do, give you an example of this in a second, but this is then what you can do with that content, with that specification, in order to start to do what I say, to identify what it is you need to know about it, and not just think I've got to know everything about all of this. So what I suggest then, suggested task two, is to go over the content in the specification and anything you've worked on, because you might have been given stuff that's not in specification, and that's fine, that's extra detail, isn't it? And identify which elements then are which key concept, which is talking about cause and continuity, which is, uh, sorry, cause and consequence, which is talking about change and continuity, significant individuals, turning points, similarity and difference, etc. And these can be, in many ways, these can be quite straightforward, right? For example, in option two, where it talks about the Western Ket and Wyatt rebellions, it's quite simply what the cause of it, what's the consequence of it. You don't need to know about change and continuity. You can't compare these necessarily to other rebellions across the time. It's what are the cause and consequence of them. Voltaire, about uh, in option five, France, about significant individual. So again, it's not about knowing everything there is to possibly know about Voltaire. It's about what makes him a significant individual. Option 10, right, uh, 1917 re uh, revolution. Uh, looking at it as a turning point. It could also be a cause and consequence, possibly, right? But there is a fundamental change afterwards, which makes it a turning point. The fact that we have the Bolshevik regime come, up, come out afterwards means that we can really refer to it as a turning point. And option 10, again, right, for example, a cult of personality under Brezhnev. Similarity and difference as you compare it to a cult of personality around the Tsar and around Stalin as well, right? Two other key figures during the time period. And therefore, crucially, what you're doing is you're ensuring you focus on the key concepts and not wasting time knowing every detail about every event. Firstly, your brain will never, ever cope with every detail of every event, right? Secondly, you will never have enough time in the exam to write about every detail of every event that it's asking you to in the question. So it's not about learning every single key bit at all. 
So this then is a specification for theme two within the American century, making of American superpower. So if we're thinking then about significant individuals, right, we can see here that we've got FDR or Franklin D. Roosevelt listed as a individual here. And so he is a significant individual. And it's only about his idea, about his role as an individual, on which we could focus. Um, same here for, quite possibly, Reagan, right? Now, if I should change the colour then, and say we go purple for, let's go cause and consequence. Well, American imperialism in the late 19th century, we're thinking definitely about the cause and consequence of that, right? The cause of why America becomes imperialistic, and also then the consequence of it. It's not a significant individual. Right? It's not a turning point. It's not a change in continuity because it's only a, it's on one, uh, one time period. Um, if we think about turning points, right? So let's do turning point in a different color. Let's go turning point as green, say, right? Entry into the First World War. That is 100% a turning point. Entry into the Second World War. Again, 100% a turning point. And so what you're doing is you're understanding that I don't need to know every single detail about the First World War, about the Second World War, about American involvement. In fact, really, if you look at it, when it talks about the First World War, it doesn't necessarily tell you that you need to know everything about, or you need to know much about the specifics of the battles that it fought in and things like that. It's about how it was a turning point that they entered. How did it fundamentally change American foreign policy to join in? So that's what I mean, right, in terms of going through and highlighting the specification in order to hone down. So I now know from that, that entering the First World War, it means I don't need to look at everything that happened as part of the First World War. To focus on that, I don't need to. Same with entering to the Second World War. I don't need to focus on every single detail of the Second World War. So that's oh no, another task, right? Another suggested task in order to be familiar with all the key terminology or the key terms, because really what they do is they help you to show off your understanding of that area of study. Another suggested task I, I may suggest to you is just making a list of all the key terminology that you've come across, like words, phrases that you wouldn't have known without studying that topic. Right, whether that's if you're doing option 10, Bolshevik, whether that's if you're doing option 8, American century, uh, whether that's manifest destiny, right? Things that you wouldn't know what they were before studying that topic. And a good way of doing this, right, literally go, go through all your notes and highlight those key terms, those key things, maybe they're in a foreign language if you're doing Russia or if you're doing Germany or something like that, or otherwise things that you, you wouldn't be able to look up in a dictionary and find a definition for. And by doing that, by showing you can define them all, you are again managing the content. Because if you can use a key term rather than having to explain it in a million bits of detail, then what you're doing is you are allowing yourself a little bit more breathing space when it comes to revision. So another example here, right, option nine, Germany. You've got, these are the key terms I'd say you'd come across in studying that, that option. Weltpolitik, Volkermeinschaft, Autarky, Denazification, March laid, social market economy, the Bundestag, the Reichstag, the Kaiser social democracy, Führer Prinzip, Berlin blockade, Cold War. Without studying that option, you wouldn't know what Volkermeinschaft meant. So by making a key list or a list of all these key terms, what you and then defining it, what you're doing is you're managing that content. Rather than having to explain everything about Volk Volkermeinschaft, you could just use that term Volkgemeinschaft. And that way you're managing the content. You're stopping it from being this big burden that's just too much information for you to cope with. Now, once you've done that, right, you know, these are kind of almost step by step, aren't they? You've got to find the specification in order to identify the key concepts. When you've identified the key concepts, you can start to identify the key terms. And then this next task is what we call RAG rating, right? RAG standing for red, amber, and green. Now, this is to ensure that you are aware of your own understanding and your own weaknesses. So by going through these bits of the specification, you can then highlight bits in red that you don't understand the content or the concept, bits in amber that you kind of understand, bits of green that you don't understand, right? So I've got green here, or you do understand, sorry. So for example, right, assassination of Martin Luther King, definitely green for me, right? If I was to think of, 
and amber right um, I would say the freedom riders actually for me right even though I teach it I'd say the freedom riders and something I definitely feel always uncomfortable teaching every time I do it is probably about migration south to north so what I've done there is I've started to identify where I need to focus my attention on most as well during my revision if I'm spending a large portion of my revision time on the stuff I already know, I am frankly wasting my time because I already know it. There's no point going over it if I already know it. So by highlighting what you do know, what you kind of know and what you don't know, you're able to then make it easier to manage the content and focus your revision. Remember though, while you're doing this, right, you're doing this from the perspective of the concept. So if it's the assassination of Martin Luther King, I'm doing it from the concept of, is it a turning point? I'm not looking at all the causes or the consequences. I'm looking at, is it a turning point? And not from, if you just understand everything, there is to possibly understand about the event or person, right? If I was to do, do I know everything about the event, the person that is Martin Luther King, the assassination of it in 1968, it would always be a red. It would always be a red because I'm never going to understand every single bit about it in a million years. It's just not possible. You've got historians who've been writing books on this for the last 50 years and they still probably don't know everything about it. Right. So you're not going to it being one amongst loads of things that you're trying to get in your head ready for the exam. So make sure it's from that concept. And as I said, right after you've done that, you know, you've gone through and identified those concepts. What you can do as well is you can compare that against the exam board with that link I put in earlier on as well. So, you know, again, there is a uh, another task. Now, this next one is really good, particularly for the similarity and difference. And this is what we call a linking activity. Now, linking activities are very, very beneficial in allowing you to contextualize the content. And so therefore, make sure that you're viewing this as one big interconnected story. As I said at the beginning, it's a breadth study, isn't it? It is over a long period of time. And so we need to be able to make links between what happens at the beginning of that time period and what happens at the end of that time period as well. And that way you don't become overburdened, as I say, with trying to understand each event in isolation, because if you understand the connections between them, then you don't need to know every single bit about each individual event. You can in your brain start to sort it and those links will start to make it clearer in your head and start to make your recall of it even better. And recall of this stuff is really important, isn't it? Because when you're in that exam, you sat down in front of that exam paper, you've got an hour and three quarters to do these two essays. Then if you can't recall it and it's stuck in the back of your brain and you've got all these bits, I'm just I'm thinking I'm picturing a uh, the mind uh, mind palace now, Sherlock Holmes, right? If it's in all these separate locked compartments where you've not linked it, it's gonna be very hard to do it. If like the mind palace of uh, Sherlock Holmes, you've made all those connections already in your mind and you've got those passageways between it, then it's gonna make that recall much easier and it's going to be much easier for you to sit down and write those exam questions because you've always got the knowledge coming out ready. So what I suggest you do in my suggested task five is that you create a linked mind map based around a sub time frame or a key concept or a certain area. And so the examples will be this, right? I'll go through these two first and I'll go back to that next one uh, that last one because I will uh, I'll give you an example of it, right? So this, for example, right, could be key terminology for option six, right, parliamentary reform and protest. The exam board in that bit I showed you at the beginning, which you can find on their website, they have listed all the key terminology for this theme or for, or for this option in theme two, popular protest, as being the following, the French Revolution, Chartism, poor, Luddism, mid-Victorian prosperity, law reform, industrialization, the London corresponding society. Now, what you can do initially, step one, is using your knowledge, explain what each key term means. Give it a definition, right? Define it, but just using what you've got up in your mind so far, right? Not anything that's around you. Secondly, then, use your work with revision notes to add to that definition, right? Flesh out a bit. Is there anything, you know, could you not define one of them actually because you'd forgotten it? And then highlight links between each key term, right? And do that by drawing arrows, and I'll do that in a second for, for the unit I teach me. Same here, I've given, you know, created another one here, right? Poverty, protest and rebellion, right? Uh, theme one, cause and consequence. So option two, theme one, cause and consequence. 
Well, these are what the exam board lists as the cause and consequences. Poor law, role of the church, the poor laws of 1531 and 1536, enclosure and estates management, and the poor law of 1601. So again, use your knowledge to explain that cause and the consequence of each event. Use your revision notes to add to it, but then crucially, link them up. Use the arrows to link them up, right? And you can see exam question here, right? The most significant cause of poverty and vagrancy in the period 1509 to 1553 was enclosures discussed. So that essay question that come from the exam board is specifically going to ask you to compare whether enclosures is more or less important than these other things. Is it a more or less significant cause of poverty than the poor law of 40, no, sorry, not poor law of 1495, because that's how it's had to be period, but the poor laws of 1531 and 1536. And so by making those links, it's going to be much easier for you to compare in the essay, and that's exactly what they're looking for in a good essay question. So example being this, right? Let's get my pen. So Jim, uh, American Century, right? Option eight, theme one, the struggle for civil rights. Causes and consequences, right? They've suggested that the impact of Jim Crow laws, the New Deal, racial desegregation, presidential activism, and civil rights are events we need to look at the cause and consequence of. So initially starting by defining what each event is. So New Deal, I can say, right, was FDR. I can say it created a load of alphabet agencies. My writing is particularly poor, but hopefully you'll pick it up anyway, right? Um, and uh, you can say that uh, not focused on one group as well, right? It wasn't specifically focused on ho helping African Americans, even if it did have a big impact on them as well. Not focused on one group. And I could do the same for the others, right? Impact of the Jim Crow laws, racial desegregation, civil rights movement. You know, so I'm talking civil rights movement. We're talking core. We're talking um, uh, sit-ins, we're talking Martin Luther King, etc. right? So I'm building up a definition. That's just off the top of my brain, isn't it? But I'm never, you know, as you can see there in the civil rights movement, I was pausing anyway because I'm trying to think it, but also my notes would help me add more to it, right? What other civil rights movements were there? Uh, NAACP, I'm just thinking of my head now, could have added as well. And then crucially, as I said, number three, making links between them, right? So for example, impact Jim Crow laws and New Deal. Now a link between this is almost certainly the fact that these prohibited jobs for African-Americans, right? That legacy of the Jim Crow laws meant that when it came to the New Deal, um, I say the legacy of Jim Crow laws, actually, not necessarily always so the legacy at this time. But when that New Deal came about cr trying to create new jobs for, uh, for the whole country in order to dig them out of this financial situation, many uh, African-Americans refused those jobs simply because of the impact of Jim Crow laws. Because Jim Crow laws and the legacy of it and the reality of it still in some places meant that African-Americans were not prioritised for jobs. White Americans were prioritised instead. And by getting that link in my head, what I'm doing is I'm making my recall slightly easier for the exam. But also, if I've got an exam question like this, how far do you agree that the work of President Johnson had the most significant influence upon the achievement of civil rights for African Americans in a period 1941 to 1968? What I'm doing is I'm already starting to answer that question. Right. Obviously, what I've done is outside this time period. Right. But nonetheless, if that time period was 1890 to 1968, this would be perfect. What it's doing is it's creating that link in your head and it's helping you manage the content. It's helping you understand you don't need to know every little detail about the Jim Crow laws. You don't need to know every detail about the New Deal. When the New Deal is listed as cause and consequence, you need to know about the causes of the New Deal, the economic climate, the Wall Street crash, the role of FDR, and you need to know the consequences of it, the creation of the alphabet agencies, the fact that it did increase employment amongst many of the, the, the poorest communities in America, but that it didn't Im, uh, improve it proportionally any better in African-American communities to Chinese-American communities. And so you are honing in on that cause and consequence. And my last, I think, last suggested task for managing content is this, right? For each turning point or significant individual highlighting the specification in those earlier documents, right? That's on the WJC website. Go back to that colourful document at the beginning I showed you, 
right? What you can do is you can draw up the following, right? These are kind of spectrums, aren't they, right? Minor impact one side, major impact on the other side. Turning point, label it. What is the detail? Given a detailed explanation. So here's an example, right, for my module. Okay, let's go. Turning point, World War One. It's listed as a turning point. I think personally, it is a massive turning point, right? So I can fill it in that much, right? And I'd be saying that that is due to the fact that it saw a spread of manifest destiny outside of America for the first time, right? Fighting for democratic values. Whilst World War II, I'm going to say, had less of an impact, right? Still fairly major, but less of an impact. Now, in my head, then, I know if I get a turning point question, I know that I'm going to say the World War I was more of a turning point than World War II. World War II didn't really change America, fundamentally change its values. It just saw it kind of getting involved in the European context again. And that'd be my detailed explanation, focusing on that long term impact. So, again, it's a comparison tool, isn't it? That when you start to compare, you start to understand it a bit better. So, here's another example, right? Um, this is from then option three, right? You know, publication of 95 theses, or theses, sorry. Um, fairly major impact, but not as big as the Diet of Worms, 1521, which had an even bigger one. And this would help you with this question here. How far do you agree that the publication of Martin Luther's 95 Theses was the major turning point in religion in the period 1500 to 1600? Not a question I've made up, right? A question that's come from the exam board. So something like that would help you, you know, unbelievably in terms of making that argument as a revision tool. As a revision tool, it's something that can help you focus on those key concepts and make the content manageable for you, right? Your brain is only so big. Again, same, right, significant individuals, John Calvin, uh, Ulrich Zwingli, maybe is how you say it, Martin Luther, right? Again, how was John Calvin the most significant influence on the spread of Protestantism between 1521 and 1559? Again, I'm doing the same thing here, aren't I? So I'd say my conclusion ultimately for this would be that Martin Luther had the most significant influence, not John Calvin. So that comparing allows you to do that. I lied, didn't I? That wasn't the last one. Got five minutes, that's all good, right? So you've been taught this unit thematically, not necessarily chronologically. I don't always teach it from 1890 to 1990 because that's not what the exam board are asking and that's not necessarily how they'll ask their questions. So a key way then to make sure your mind, um, sorry, a key way to make sense of it in your mind is to create a timeline. And this is crucial then to understand in the context of each item. Change, turn what your teachers or your lecturers have done with you into a timeline and that'll help it cement in your mind as well, right? Another way to deal with this content, it helps you pull it all together. So, here's an absolute whistle stop tool, right? The beauty of this is it's going to be uh, posted online under the Catalan Cymru, uh, just Google Catalan Cymru and it'll be there. And you can pause it as many times as you want in order to stop, do a task, move on, do a task, move on, right? That's the beauty of this. What I've tried to do is I've just tried to really you know, give you an understanding of what they're looking for, give you some tasks in order to help you with that, to make sure that this content isn't just blowing your mind because it could be so easy for it to do, right? Um, when I first sat down to think, well, how am I going to teach this all those years ago? It blew my mind. But then I worked out, I need to focus on this aspect, this aspect, and this aspect. So that brings us to the end of this. I'll have a look in a second to see if there's any questions. This brings us to the end of this, right? That's session one done. Right. Session two uh, will be next week, as I say, we'll be focusing on essay writing skills and developing a reason argument, whilst the week after then focusing on unit four, and then the last one looking at a good essay, right? A good essay, trying to break it down. What they've done that means that this essay is a good essay. So lastly, what asked me to all it, all I need to do is to see if you've got any questions at all. Throw them in the uh, in the chat and uh, I'm sure Miss will uh, ask me those questions now if there are any at all. Thank you, Andrew. Doesn't seem to be any new questions, but you've uh, co certainly taught me a lot of things today. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, Happy yeah, days. Well. Looking forward to next week. Tim Proper Gopal. Dilkamara thought for coming on, guys, and um, I look forward to uh, seeing you again next week.